So we're introducing this thing that's kind of new for some people, I'm sure, for most of us, many of us. And as Catholic Christians, whenever anything new is introduced to us, the first thing we have to do is make sure that it fits perfectly, beautifully, harmoniously with the faith itself as expressed in public revelation and in sacred tradition. Those are what Vatican II, I believe, calls the two wellsprings of the Word of God, both in Scripture itself and in sacred tradition. So if anyone presents something to you, some new spiritual thing, and it's not solidly grounded and harmonious with both of those two, we shouldn't have anything to do with it as Catholic Christians. So let's get as central, as foundational as possible with our faith. Let's back up to the single thing, perhaps more than anything else, you could say is the pillar, the foundation, the central dimension of Christianity itself. And I want you to think for a moment about what that might be as I give some hints as to what I'm gonna present to you that it is. It's directly from Jesus. It's in the Gospels. It's in the Didache, which is a document that called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. So as the name implies, written by the apostles themselves, close to, close to scripture in importance, the Didache. It's in every Mass that's been said for 2,000 years. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian in history, he calls it the most perfect of prayers. The Catechism calls it the fundamental Christian prayer and the quintessential prayer of the Church. The Church Father Tertullian calls it a summary of the whole Gospel. Any guesses as to what I'm talking about here? The Our Father, yep. The Lord's Prayer the climax of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the greatest prayer. Nothing could be more essential to our faith and our sacred tradition as Catholic Christians than the Our Father. Nothing could be more traditional, nothing could be more Catholic than diving as deeply as we can into the essence of the Our Father. Because the Our Father, every single word of it's superlatively important, but even the Our Father has an essence. And if we want to fulfill our calling as Christians the best possible way, I think that one of the most powerful things we can do, if not the most powerful thing we can do, is to dive into that essence of the Lord's Prayer. But let's see what the Catechism says here. Since our prayer sets forth our desires before God, it is again the Father, he who searches the hearts of men, who knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The prayer to our Father, it's talking about the Our Father here, is inserted into the mysterious mission of the Son and the Spirit. In the Eucharistic liturgy, the Mass, the Lord's Prayer appears as the prayer of the whole Church, and there it reveals the full, its full meaning and efficacy, that is, its power. Placed between the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, and the communion, when we receive communion, the Lord's Prayer sums up, on the one hand, all the petitions and intercessions expressed in the movement of the Epiclesis, the movement of the Spirit, and on the other hand, it knocks at the door of the banquet of the Kingdom of Heaven, which sacramental communion anticipates. All right, those, those are the lofty words that the Catechism uses to teach about the nature of the Our Father. And what's in that? In that paragraph are three keys that we should remember. The Our Father is not just a prayer that we say and then forget, it's actually the model of our own desire. The, our Father should be the model of our own desires, the Catechism's teaching that. Two, that it's part of the mysterious mission of the Trinity itself. And three, that it's the ultimate link between heaven and earth. That's what the, that's what the Catechism is saying there in so many words. And the first teaching, that we should inflame our desires according to the Our Father. St. Augustine relayed that beautifully. He said, run through all the words of the holy prayers in Scripture, and I do not think that you will find anything in them that is not contained and included in the Lord's Prayer. So by using the Lord's Prayer as a model for our whole life, we're not neglecting anything else. And we have to always make sure we never neglect anything in the faith. But uh, the Our Father is, we're certainly at no risk of doing that by choosing the Our Father as the model of our life. Everything's in it. That's what we want to do if we want to be the best Christians, the best Catholics possible. Model, model our lives in accordance with it. But the Catechism is also saying 
with its second and third teachings we just noted, that the Our Father is much more. It's much more than it might appear at first glance. It's the Trinity's, it's, it's, it describes the Trinity's mysterious mission and it's the link between heaven and earth. So if we really wanna dive into the Our Father more than we have before, we have to understand something about this mysterious mission of the Holy Trinity. And this mysterious mission of the Holy Trinity is for us, our participation in that mission, I should say, is about sitting around and eating cookies waiting for the end of the world, right? That's, that's, is that all we're doing when we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Just as just asking for the world to end and waiting around for that to happen? No, of course not. Of course not. Some people, unfortunately, that's the sense they get, that when we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're just praying for the end of time. And of course, there's the final coming of Christ in the flesh. Of course, we anticipate that, look forward to it, pray for it. But that's not all we're doing when we're, when we're praying for the accomplishment of God's will on earth as in heaven. That would make the petition almost pointless, wouldn't it? If there wasn't something on earth that needs to happen as well to better mimic, to better correspond to heaven. I want to read a quote here uh, from a church historian, Professor Jacques Cabal, the Catholic scholar here. He starts this quote with a little bit of sarcasm that I have to read. He says, when we recite the Our Father, we petition God for the abolition of life on earth. What a paradox. We know no better way of honoring the creator than to aspire for the extinction of our species. All right, so he, he's, he couldn't help with the sarcasm. Now he gets a little more serious and he says, most of us would find such an interpretation aberrant. I suspect that many people nonetheless, when they recite the Lord's Prayer, they have the impression that they're only praying for their coming to a heaven hereafter. Do they realize, however, that this would imply the concomitant destruction of our world? Are the theologians who deny the possibility of an establishment of the kingdom of God on earth aware that they are thereby excluding the literal interpretation of the two fundamental demands of the Our Father? Is there anyone in his right mind who would say, please, Lord, we beg of you, destroy this world, which is unworthy, of your divine concern. Nobody would be caught expressing himself in this fashion. The Our Father is rather in its first half an eschatological prayer, and we should read it in precisely those terms. The coming of the kingdom that it evokes is good news, not only for hereafter, saying not only for heaven, that's of course the supreme end, but it's not only about that. He says, the kingdom will come at the right moment. You should petition for its coming with faith, perseverance, and a joyful heart. Almighty God, may thy kingdom come. May thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This kingdom is the purpose of creation. It should have happened earlier. Original sin delayed its coming, but did not preclude it forever. You know, everything that I'm trying to say, that he's trying to say, and that maybe it's safe to say, that everything Jesus is trying to tell the servant of God, Luis Picaretta, is that those words mean what they say. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that you don't have to feel ashamed praying those words with full faith, full confidence, that they really mean what they say. All right, so the Our Father is the blueprint of history as well. If all of Christianity can be seen in the Our Father, then all of history can also be seen in it. We know if we wanna look at the overarching plan of history, we have to look at its beginning. We know how it began, the Garden of Eden, everything perfect, God's will was done on earth as in heaven in the garden. Adam went ahead and ruined that for us, but we don't stress about that fact. We don't, we were not angry at Adam, why? What, what do we pray in the exultet at Easter? Oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin, which, which, um, shoot, <laughs> which, got, which got for us so great a redeemer. It's not the got isn't the word, but it's something like that. We, we, we ironically almost praise God for this sin of Adam because because of it, Jesus came into the world and he's, he's fixed everything. He's begun the fixing of all things with his sacrifice on the cross. That's the climax of the story of history. But it hasn't all been fulfilled yet, of course. There's still much work to be done. And it's going because of, because of Adam's sin. What, how Jesus is going to fix everything, how he's going to set everything right is going to be better than it ever would have been if Adam never sinned. That's how God always fixes things. 
He doesn't just try and make it back like it was. He always makes it even better. In fact, that's something we can philosophically know about the nature of God, that he only even allows any evil to occur if he knows, not just that he's going to fix it, but that he's going to bring an even greater good out of it. We can be certain of that. But every, every evil, every pain, every suffering, every unfortunate thing of any sort is always and only a precursor always a precursor to God doing something even better that wouldn't have been possible in any other way. Now, if that's possible, if that's the case always with God, and it is, then it's certainly the case with the fall of man itself. God's going to fix that. His will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus prayed it. He prophesied it. It's a guarantee. All right. Before the world ends, therefore, it will return. St. Thomas Aquinas, got to quote him again, he says, all things find their perfection in returning to their origin. All things find their perfection in returning to their origin. So that's, um, and remember, he's this great theologian saint who lived many hundreds of years ago. He's got nothing to do with, specifically with Luis Picaretta, but his teachings are very powerful here. He's, so if we think about this process, the, like a, a, what does every plant start with? A seed, it goes from seed to the, the first sprouts, the seedling, the, the shoot, the plant gets developed and mature, eventually it develops its fruit, and then the culmination of this plant's life is found in what's in the very core of that fruit, and it's the purpose of this whole plant's generation, well, yet another seed. So all things find their perfection in returning to their origin. That's going to be the case with history also. The world, the church, came forth from God's hands, holy, beautiful, and it must return to him before the end of time in the same manner, or rather an even more glorious manner. So we're focusing here on the central petition of the Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're only really doing that for the sake of time. I mean, every, as I said before, every single word in the Our Father is so important that you could spend your whole life to any word in it, and you'd still only scratch the surface. But the works of God, they always have hierarchy. There's always some form of hierarchy in everything God does because hierarchy is beautiful. Uh, he doesn't, when, when God makes something, it's not like a warehouse. It's, more, it's like a cathedral. It's not like elevator music. It's like a symphony. There's all sorts of variety in what he does. So in the, Our Father itself, it also has a hierarchy, notwithstanding the extreme, superlative, infinite importance of each of its petitions. But it builds. In its first half, it builds towards its climax in that petition we're talking about, which is the greatest petition of the Our Father. But how do we know that? How do we know that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the greatest? Well, it's the petition that contains all other petitions within itself. And the whole is always greater than the part. What contains something else within it cannot itself be surpassed by one of its parts. It's a philosophical first principle. I'll, I will not get too much more into that. But if God's will is done on earth, as it is in heaven, then everything else is taken care of, isn't it? Where we, we will have forgiveness then, we'll have our, our deliverance from evil, our deliverance from temptation, we'll have our daily bread, God's name will be hallowed, his kingdom will have come as much as possible on earth. All of those things are accomplished within his will being done on earth as in heaven. Christianity itself, the whole faith, is actually contained within that one petition. Uh, Scott Hahn wrote, the Lord's Prayer is one unified, compact model prayer consisting of seven petitions dividable into two parts. The first, God word. The second, us word. And he says, no poetic work of art was ever more perfectly crafted. And he's right. The Our Father is also perfect poetry. And what that, that tells us something about the nature of the petitions in it. I want to quote another biblical scholar here. He talked about the Our Father as a hymnic prose poem, which has synonymous poetic parallelism between the first half about God's name, kingdom, and will, and the second half about our bread, debt, and temptation. Each half is itself in crescendo or climactic parallelism, building up through the three component challenges, name and kingdom come to a climax in will. So that's about the most I've ever said about poetry in my life. I know nothing about how it works, but it sounds right to me. You know, I know nothing about music either, but I can, I can tell a harmonious note when I hear one, as we all can, versus a discordant one. 
And I think we can all see the poetry in the Our Father itself. You know, why wouldn't Jesus have also made it be a perfect poetic work of art, as Scott Hahn says, and he's, he's, again, he's right about that. Let's, uh, let's look at some even more authoritative voices here on this petition. Servant of God, Archbishop Louis Martinez. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. He's gonna become much more famous soon. He was the spiritual director of Blessed Conchita, a mystic who was beatified, and I'm gonna share some quotes with her, from her later. An incredibly holy, amazing archbishop in Mexico from the 20th century. He taught, and he wrote a great book called The Sanctifier on the Holy Spirit. He also taught, and this, I think this quote might actually be from The Sanctifier. Jesus laid bare the fundamental longing of his soul when he taught us to say, and he guesses, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Archbishop, the servant of God, Archbishop Martinez, he's saying that's the fundamental desire of Jesus' soul, is, is teaching us to pray those words. The will of God, this is continuing from uh, the Archbishop here, the will of God is to reflect himself in creatures. The fulfillment of that will is his glory. It is the end of all his works and the end of all his creatures. Their happiness, that is, our happiness, consists in cooperating in its accomplishment. It's okay to want to be happy. It is okay. And guess where you'll find your happiness? In the accomplishment of God's will. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. So it's Jesus' passion. It's what he longs for for us more than anything else. And it's the thing that will give us everything we could ever want, the will of God. St. John Chrysostom is the father of the church. He's got a beautiful teaching on this petition. He's often considered the greatest of the Eastern fathers. So this is a very central voice in sacred tradition. He says, for God did not say, thy will be done in me or in us. He's talking about the Our Father here but everywhere on earth, so that error may be destroyed, truth implanted, and all wickedness cast out, and virtue return, and no difference in this respect be henceforth between heaven and earth. No difference in this respect between heaven and earth. So he says, in this respect, that's very important. There's always a difference between heaven and earth. We don't get to heaven until we get to heaven. We don't get the beatific vision until we actually see God face to face in heaven and all the other things that that entails. But his will, God's will can be accomplished on earth as in heaven. And it must be. It must, we must return to that state. Jesus wouldn't have taught us to pray something impossible, would he? St. John Cashin, he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There cannot be a greater prayer than to desire that earthly things should, deserve, should equal heavenly ones. He's saying you can't even imagine a greater prayer than that. St. Alphonsus Liguori, he has a comment about another saint, St. Catherine of Genoa, about a private revelation to that saint. He says, the Lord recommended to St. Catherine of Genoa that every time she said the Our Father to pay particular attention to these words, guess which ones, thy will be done, and to beg for the grace to fulfill the will of God as perfectly as the saints in heaven. All right, I'm gonna stop with those quotes because I need to get further here. But um, we could go on for a long time with quotes like that, but the point is that everything is within this. Everything is within. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything is in the triumph of the divine will. If we have that, we don't have to worry about every, anything else because we have everything within that. If we have everything else but that, we've got nothing. We could compress it, though, we could compress the words, thy will be done, that supreme petition. We could compress it into um, just one word, if we wanted to also. Fiat. There's a, there's a pop quiz. How did everything, how did it all begin? Just everything, how did everything begin? The beginning. It's, I think this is just a couple verses into scripture. And God said, let there be light. And in the original Latin, I mean, not that Genesis was written in Latin, but the official Vulgate, it's fiat lux, the very first words God spoke ever in the history of creation, record, recounted in scripture, fiat lux, let there be light. Fiat, it's, and of course, if you pray the Our Father in Latin, you're also, you're, you're, you're reminded of this because you're praying fiat voluntas tua, that will be done. So it's not just this, this fiat, the, what's contained in the fiat is not just 
the essence and the primary petition of the Our Father. It's not just the, uh, the essence of Christianity itself as if that weren't enough, but it's also that which called existence into being. It's what we have to thank for our existence itself. We don't thank God for our existence often enough, do we? we? We thank him for individual blessings as we should, but you know, our first and greatest good is the fact that we exist. And nothing else, no one, we can't receive any blessings if we don't exist first. So we need to uh, be more cognizant of the grace of our existence. Mother Angelica wrote a beautiful piece on that. I highly recommend it. That's all I can do is recommend it because I don't even remember what it's called. But she gave us this meditation about the, the God hovering over all these infinite possibilities for who he could create. And the mere fact that you were called into existence, you might think you're just, I'm just one of billions of people. Do you know how many trillions, quadrillions, Google Plexes of people God could have created but didn't in order to create you? It's unfathomable. Our existence is our first and greatest good, and that's thanks to the fiat. There's another really important fiat in Scripture, though, isn't there? Dicit autem Maria, ecce ancilla domini fiat mihi secundum verbum tu. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We've got exi our existence. We thank the fiat for our existence, but we also thank our eligibility for eternal life to another fiat, the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth has a powerful teaching on this I need to share. He says, The moment when the angel of the Lord came to Mary with the great announcement of the Incarnation, she gave her reply, then transpired the greatest event in our history, the Incarnation. The Word became flesh. Mary placed her entire being at the disposal of God's will. The will of Mary coincides with the will of her Son in the Father's unique project of love. And in Mary, heaven and earth are united. God the Creator is united to His creature. Remember, the link between heaven and earth in the Our Father. We're seeing that physically transpiring in Mary. How? because of her fiat, which means what? Benedict is saying, it means that the, her will coincides perfectly with the will of her son. It is, he continues on, this union of heaven and earth is the purpose of the incarnation and redemption. Christianity is the purpose of it. So Benedict is saying that everything can be found in that. That the, and this is, this fiat is made possible by Mary's will, the union of Mary's will with the divine will, which, to spoil the plot for you here right now, is exactly what God is calling all of us to. Now that this grace is available, a union of our wills with the divine will that's modeled after Our Lady's own union with the divine will. And we'll never be another Our Lady. We'll never match her, much less exceed her. No one ever will. That's impossible. She shall always be the greatest. But the point is, we are now being called to enter into that same type of life, of union of wills that Mary always had with her son, with the will of her son, the divine will of her son. Pope Benedict taught again, to be devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary means to embrace this attitude of heart which makes fiat, your will be done, the defining center of one's whole life the defining center of one's whole life. He's, uh, he's, and he's saying that this is what you could describe devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary as. That's just one way of looking at it. This is also just the fundamental to the faith, making the fiat the defining center of your life. So we're seeing quite a convergence here around this petition, aren't we? Around the words, thy will be done, or fiat, on earth as it is in heaven. History itself, Christianity itself, the entire calling, our, our entire life, everything, all of it's in this. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can't possibly overestimate the importance of that. But before we move on from its centrality in our faith, there's one more fiat we really have to acknowledge, isn't there? Because it's not just Mary who models this for us. Her son, Jesus is God, of course, yes, but did he have a human will? Yes, he did. It can be easier to forget that. He did have a human will. He was fully God and fully man, and to be fully man, you can't be fully human unless you also have a human will. So yes, he had a human will, 
And he also modeled perfectly for us how to keep that will in absolute union with the divine will. The Catechism teaches that the whole prayer of Jesus is contained in a certain few words. And you can all guess what they are. Yes, it's in the central petition of the Our Father, but where else did Jesus say those exact same words? Gethsemane, yeah. Nevertheless, thy will, not mine, be done. The agony in the garden. When Jesus, he had a human will, yes, but in the agony in the garden with those words, he modeled for us how to keep our will always, no matter what, no matter the cross, no matter the circumstances, to keep our will absolutely united to the divine will. It's the paradigm of his whole life. St. John, we got a St. John Chrysostom, who we quoted earlier, he also says here, Jesus prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. It is clear here that his human will is in full harmony with God's will. This harmony is what we must always seek after and follow. That's the model for our lives. And everywhere we look for the supremely important, dramatic moments of, of eschatological, un unrivaled importance in public revelation, we find them all converging around the fiat. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Benedict, we have to quote Benedict one more time here. I shouldn't say one more time. We're going to get to him again. He's, uh, he's got so much wisdom to share in this. Benedict says, in Jesus' prayer, not my will, but your will be done. He recapitulates the whole process of his life. God's will is the place where we find our true identity. God created us. We are ourselves if we conform with his will. Only in this way do we enter into the truth of our being. Redemption is always this process of leading the human will to communion with the divine will. It is a process for which we pray every day, may your will be done. All right, a recapitulation is to summarize and repeat the main point of something. Benedict is teaching us that this prayer, not my will but thine be done, is the recapitulation of Jesus' whole life. All right. It's something he certainly said during his life as well, even if we fail to see that centrality in the Garden of Gethsemane, which it does have. We see it elsewhere in the Gospel also. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother, as Matthew 12, 50. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Those are just also all different quotes of Jesus in the Gospels themselves. For Jesus, the will of his Father was the foundation of his relationship with souls. In the Our Father, we find these words that seem to come forth as a triumphant cry from the depths of his soul. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wished to tell us in our own language how avidly he sought to do the Father's will and how that will was his very life, the foundation of his soul, the norm of perfection, the secret of happiness, the repose of love. That's again, that quote is again from the servant of God, Archbishop Louis Martinez. All right, so much more we could say about that. But at this point, I don't think too many people need a lot more convincing that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is everything. We've already seen that it's the object, the thing that we're considering in the greatest petition of the greatest prayer, that it's the fundamental principle of scripture, public revelation itself, that it's the life and breath of Jesus and his most holy mother. But that's all just in the foundation. So public revelation, scripture, that's the foundation of our faith. And we're seeing all of this in the foundation. So what do you do with a foundation? What's the point of a foundation? Like, do you just, does it just sit there and, and, and then you can play on it? Well, no, you have a foundation laid down to build on. And the fundamental design of the foundation, you can look at that and you can infer what the building itself, how the building itself is gonna develop. You can't infer the details, of course. But you can infer the direction that it's gonna go in. The foundation is key because it's immovable. Once the foundation's down, and I'm talking analogously, of course, about putting a, building a literal structure, you don't move it, no matter what. You're stuck building the building on top of that. You don't negotiate with it. You don't mess with it. 
That's the analogy, that's public revelation in scripture. After the death of the apostle John, no new public revelation, no matter what, till the end of time. There will never be a new public revelation, a new scripture. But that doesn't mean that what God was doing in laying down the foundation stopped when the foundation was done. It actually means the opposite. When, you, when you're fun, done with the foundation, you can really get to work building on it. You, you have the blueprint set down. You don't have to wonder anymore where the building's ultimately going to be. You don't have to, you don't have to wonder what, where you should be building. Right there, right on that foundation. So public revelation's main thrust, would we see it just stop at the close of the age of public revelation? Of course not. We see the opposite. We see God getting to work even more zealously in revealing, not by way of inspiring more scriptures, but by speaking interiorly to the saints, revealing the full glory contained in the accomplishment of his will on earth as it is in heaven. And that is exactly what we see. That's exactly what we see in what followed public revelation in the development of sacred tradition. Remember we said, I had said earlier that we, um, we need to say no as Catholics to anything new presented to us that's not in full harmony with both scripture and sacred tradition, the two wellsprings of the word of God. So we can see that everything is the divine will in scripture, but what about after that point? The greatest works, they take time. They take a lot of, to the greater the work, the more time it takes. So I know a lot of people wonder, well, why couldn't people who have already been at least a little bit introduced to the gift of living in the divine will and all the glories that it entails, might be tempted to say, why couldn't this all have come about 2,000 years ago? Why wouldn't this have just been in scripture itself? Why wouldn't this have been a, a devotion or something right in the beginning of Christianity? Well, that would be like teaching calculus to someone just starting algebra, is the analogy I use. It takes a lot of time to prepare for the greatest works. The foundations down, the sacred traditions development for 2,000 years consists in building the walls and the floors and everything else. But what's at the very top? Well, hopefully a solid gold steeple. And that's what the gift of living in the divine will is. We're going to see that steeple, that solid gold steeple being prepared for in these 2,000 years of sacred traditions development, which I'm going to have to heavily abridge right now because I don't have long, do I? So we're at 1040. I promise I will not force anyone to wet their pants. You will be allowed to use the, the bathroom. Uh, but should I, should I go until 11 before we take our break? Or is that, I'll, I'll, I'll aim for that, how about that? All right. The first thing we need to remember when we're going through sacred traditions development is that the same Holy Spirit who inspired every single word of scripture, he did every word of scripture, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He didn't, his job description didn't change when the apostle John died. It's true that there's no more sacred scripture, no more public revelation being revealed after that point, but the fundamental mission that God, the Holy Spirit, was undertaking in scripture, he continued. He continued doing for the, for the development of sacred tradition. And in fact, I would, God never changes, he's immutable. But our, under, our, our relation as changeable creatures, that can make some changes seem apparent. And I would say, if anything, he stepped it up. He stepped up the pace. Remember, public revelation itself in the New Testament, how long did that take to prepare for? That took 4,000 years. So, you know, 2,000 years might seem like a while, but it's actually a lot less than 4,000, isn't it? So he, uh, Jesus says something like that to Louisa, something to, along the lines of that the church is more powerful and pleasing to him than the Israelites of the Old Testament. So he can work more quickly now. And that's why it's only going to take 2,000 years for the, that's why it did only take 2,000 years for the preparation for the gift of living in the divine will. Anyway, let's not get to that till we get to it. This new era of, the, of, of God's work in the world, as I said, it was an acceleration, an acceleration in the fulfillment of his will because the works of God always move forward. And I've got to um, quote Benedict again here, Benedict the 16th. He says, there are views that see the entire history of the church in the second millennium as a gradual decline. Some even see the decline as starting immediately after the New Testament. But in fact, opera Christi non deficiunt sed proficiunt, which means 
Christ's works do not go backwards, but forwards. What would the church be without the new spirituality of the Cistercians, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, spirituality of St. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, and so forth? Benedict says, this affirmation applies today too. The works of God move forward. This doesn't mean modernism. Modernism is a heresy. Uh, what this modernism looks to the world. It looks to the development of the world to try and ascertain what to do. That's not the proper approach here. Tradition looks at what God is doing in the saints. That's how we see what true progress consists in. You look at what Pope Saint John Paul II referred to as the lived theology of the saints. We must take as an absolute fact the reality that God is always active in the lives of the saints. If we want to see what he's trying to do in the world, we look at what he did in their lives. The Catechism says that even if revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. It remains for the Christian faith to gradually grasp the full significance over the course of centuries. So it takes, this process takes centuries. It has taken centuries to get us to the point we're at today, which is the culmination of it all. This is also in the Catechism. The Holy Spirit is at work with the Father and the Son from the beginning to the completion of the plan for our salvation. But in these end times, ushered in by the Son's redeeming incarnation, the Spirit is revealed and given, recognized, and welcomed as a person. The Holy Spirit is God. He always existed. But we didn't know he was a distinct person in God until public revelation. And our welcoming him as a person, again, steps up the degree of graces available. Now this divine plan, accomplished in Christ, the firstborn and head of the new creation, can be embodied in mankind by the outpouring of the Spirit. And there's an early uh, patristic, I mean, early church saint, St. Vincent of Lorenz. He has a good quote on this. He says, certainly there is progress in the church, even exceedingly great progress. Who would be so envious of others and so hateful towards God as to try to prohibit it? And he, he says that this is necessary gradually in the, whole in the whole church over the course of centuries. He says, this is a, a saint, he's saying it would be hateful of God to try to prevent the growth that he's inspiring in the church. All right. Why are we seeing so much of this recently when it seems that only the opposite is happening? You know, if you look around the church and the world, it doesn't exactly look like things are getting better and better, does it? It seems to be the opposite. Well, it is the opposite. But that's not what has the final say. Yes, the church and the world are getting more and more mired in sin and error and ugliness. They are. But the glory of one saint outshines all the misery in the world combined. It's true. So if we want to know what God is really accomplishing, we can see what he's doing in those souls. We can see what he's bringing about in their mysticism. And it's even if they are vastly outnumbered by the sinners in the world. That's no impediment to God. But it's also true that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So God is responding. God's not, un he's not unaware of what's happening. You know, he's just as in charge today as he ever was. He he's always perfectly in charge. He's giving more grace now than ever before in history. Also, precisely because of how much we need it. Precisely because of how bad it is in the church and the world today. And for everyone who rejects a grace, God doesn't want that wasted. He's holding it out now for someone else to ask for it. So ask for all of those rejected graces, and they will be made yours. These, anyway, these graces, operative throughout church history, we're reaching the culmination of them now. And I am going to skip through more quickly here than I had anticipated, but I do want to point out just how seriously the church fathers. These are the first, the first era of sacred traditions development, the era of the fathers of the church. Their biggest teaching was divinization. Their, most, their greatest passion was that we be deified, that we be made like other Christs. There's a bunch of quotes here that you can, uh, you can see in my book if you, if you want to look at them, but they're all, they're all basically boiled down to what's called the great exchange. God was made man, that man might be made God. And that's not literal, of course. We, we ourselves always remain creatures, but it's a process of our becoming God-like through the graces available to us in Christ. This was not one of their teachings. This is not just one of 
a million opinions they had, and they had a lot of thoughts on things. Like, you, scripture, patristic scholars today, you have to dedicate your whole scholarly career to one little tiny part of the teachings of the fathers of the church to master it. Like, they, it's an enormous wealth of teachings they have. But their fundamental passion is divinization. It is deification. If we want to know what they really wanted for us, it was this. It was that we not merely be saved, not merely just get, get redeemed, get, get saved. You know, that's, that's, of course, the foundation, going from a state of mortal sin to a state of grace. That's called justification. By, by that process, we're redeemed. And yes, that's so important. You can't possibly overestimate the importance of that. But that's not the beginning of the spiritual, that's, sorry, that's not the end of the spiritual life, that's the beginning. Now, a lot of evangelicals, they treat that as the end of the spiritual life. Okay, once I was blind, now I'm not. I'm good, I'm saved, just waiting. That's not the Catholic view. The Catholic view is that that's, our begin, the, the, that's the beginning of what the mystics of the Middle Ages would call the purg purgative way. It's, we're just getting started then. So what we really want to be like is like God. St. Maximus the Confessor, he's a father of the church. I need, he's closer to the end of the age of the fathers. And he is, really has a quote here I can't skip over. And I'll first look at, yet again, Pope Benedict XVI's teaching on St. Ma I'm quoting Pope Benedict a lot, aren't I? It's, uh, I think God gave him a unique mission. And I think a lot of it has to do with precisely this. And I don't think Benedict himself knew that or knows it, but his teachings are just incredible for the divine will. And I speculate, I don't think his mission's over. I think he's still got a lot of edification to give to the church. Anyway, here's, here's what Pope Benedict says about St. Maximus. St. Maximus tells us, and we know that this is true, that Adam, and we ourselves are Adam, Pope Benedict says, Adam thought that the no was the peak of freedom, but the height of freedom is in the yes, in conformity with God's will. It is only in the yes that man becomes himself, only in the great openness to the yes, in the unification of his will with the divine, that man becomes immensely open, becomes divine. It is in the yes that man becomes free. This is the drama of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. It is by transferring the human will to the divine will that the real person is born. This, in a brief few words, is the fundamental point of what St. Maximus wanted to say. And here we see that the whole human being is truly at issue. The entire question of our life lies here. This is Pope Benedict XVI teaching on St. Maximus, who himself is saying it is all about the unification of the human will with the divine, and that this is, quote, the entire question of our life. Sounds starting to sound familiar, isn't it? Starting to, starting to see some recurring themes here. So if we want to fulfill the entire purpose of our life, we need look nowhere else than the transferring of the human will to the divine will. We keep coming back to Gethsemane. Why do we keep coming back to Gethsemane in these teachings? Because that's when it's hard to say, thy will be done, right? You know, it's, it's kind of easy to say, thy will be done when you're, when you're having a delicious breakfast over at uh, J, was JC's, is that where we went? It was just, I'm still thinking about the bacon. Um, that was just really good. And that's, that's really easy to say that I will be done sometimes. And that's, that's good. Don't feel guilty. Blessing God when things are going well. You know, we need to praise God at all times. Get, bless his will in all things. And he wills for us to enjoy ourselves. And he also wills crosses. But we focus, of course, on the crosses here, not because we should forget about God other times. In fact, Jesus laments to Louisa that some people only have this virtue of, of abnegation to his will when things are going bad, ironically because they forget to be cognizant of his will in other times in their life. But for most of us, the struggle will be in these crosses. And that's why Gethsemane is so essential. It's why we need to always remember that as our model. We, um, and these crosses can be big or small. And if they're big, if it pertains to something that's already happened, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, I, mean, I just, I'm going to end talk one in just a couple minutes, and I don't want to end this without getting to this point. If it's something that happened, guess why it happened? Because it was God's will. There's no other reason. 
for something to happen, <laughs> other than he's omnipotent, omnipotent. There's nothing he can't do, and he's purely good. So it doesn't matter why it seems like something happened. It doesn't matter how bad it seemed. It doesn't matter how bad it was, because God's not a power of positive thinking God. Like, he's aware that there are bad things, and he's honest about it. If it happened, it's because it was part of a perfect plan, and we have to trust that in the hardest things. It was part of a perfect plan. He knows exactly what's best for all of us, and we are left with just a simple choice. Do we give our fiat to that? Do we say God's will be done, or do we rebel against him? We have to always give our fiat. If we can do that in those times, we will receive the gift of living in the divine will. We will. The, um, the other things that we need to, we, this abnegation to the divine will, we also need to have it looking forward, Move, looking at things ahead of us, that it's okay to pray for things to go a certain way. That's fine. I sure do. I got kids. We're praying, we, you know, always praying for dangers and sicknesses and all that stuff to be avoided. But always when you're saying prayers like that, you do want to add a few words at the end of each such petition, don't you? Nevertheless, thy will not mine be done. Because it could be so much better for you. You know, even small things. Don't, don't only think about this in the big trials. You're coming up in a green light. It's been green for a long time. Oh, please, please, let's stay green. Please, God, please, please, God, let's stay green. But thy will be done. <laughs> and, then <it's, laughs> and then it turns red. And that's okay. Like, all the time we need to have this outlook on life. To at least squeeze one thy will be done in there at the end of those petitions. And God can work miracles through that. He, he will. Even if you get stuck at a couple red lights. It's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it for, uh, for heaven. Um, and it's worth it for the gift of living in the divine will. So we will, let's, we're going to trace out a little more the development of this, and I'm going to have to wind up putting aside most of these notes to get through it all, and that's okay. I, you, you can see there's, some, there's a lot of new stuff in here, but you can see uh, some of it in my books as well. Let me end our first talk here on that note. Always beseeching the will of God in all things great and small, good and bad, painful and comfortable, Thy will be done. Make that the mantra of your life. Make that the essence of all your passion and zeal, and you'll be all set, and soon the whole world will be all set. So we've been tracing this theme of the will of God's accomplishment on earth as in heaven through Scripture, through the life of Jesus and Mary, through the beginnings of the development of sacred tradition. We've seen its centrality in our Father, in Christianity itself, that it serves as the essence of our life, as the blueprint of history. It's basically impossible to think of a superlative that doesn't apply to this, to, to this notion of God's will being done on earth as in heaven. So this is the passion of Jesus. It's, the, it's what guided sacred, tradition, sacred tradition's development more than anything else. We saw this in the Fathers with the divinization there. And I brought up St. Maximilian, sorry, we'll get to St. Maximilian, St. Maximus, the confessor, because he in the later period of the Fathers, really directed their efforts in promoting divinization to locating that in the union of the human will with the divine will. And that's exactly what we saw in the many centuries that would follow in the development of the Church's spiritual theology, her sacred tradition, in the lived theology of the saints. We see God's fundamental work. And this is always God's most important work. I mean. There's quite a few things that have happened in church history, yes, of course, and, and uh, quite a few important things, but the most important thing that God does is hidden. I mean, what's, let's pop quiz. Who remembers what the single greatest event in history was? That we, what Benedict just told us, the incarnation. That was uh, big news in his day, right? Nope. No one even knew. No, no one had any idea except Our Lady. And, you know, that, that started to get out to more and more people. But the days we're living in now, I, uh, I, like to make, I like to relate them to those days where only a few people knew what was happening, even though it was the most earth-shattering news you could possibly imagine. And it was just this little, lowly, lowly in the eyes of the world, not in the eyes of God, obviously, this lowly virgin from Nazareth that the greatest event in history was transpiring within. 
Well, that's kind of what's happening today with the gift of living in the divine will. This lowly virgin from, not Nazareth, but Italy, has been given this gift, not for herself, and it's not from her, it's from Jesus, but it's for the world, and it's for those few of us who know about it to announce it to the world. All right, anyway. These, the greatest writings in the sacred tradition that follow the patristic era, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just kind of get rid of most of my notes here, because as usual, I prepared too much stuff, but uh, it'll, you, can, you can see it in my books, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll share with you guys what has been kind of a secret up to now, I guess. I'm working on another book that's the, um, hopefully the happy medium between maybe the crown of history is too small and the crown of sanctity is definitely too big. So uh, this is the weapon, literally. But uh, you can, you, if, I hope to soon have my medium book done, which uh, doesn't leave out the things that Crown of History does, but doesn't go into all the things that Crown of Sanctity does, so it should be manageable. And uh, if you can find everything that I didn't get a chance to say, you'll be able to find most of it in that if you find yourself so compelled in a few months to get it. Anyway, any, you, but sorry, one more point. This is all free online as a PDF. Just go to my blog, dsdoconnor.com, or just look it up, Crown of Sanctity. You'll easily find it all for free online, and you can find most of the quotes that I'm skipping over in that book. Okay. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, he was a doctor of the church, not a father. He was in the, I think, 1100s. He contributed majorly to this development. He said that in the saints, all human affections melt away into some unspeakable transmutation into the will of God. And he said, this is in accordance with what we pray for every day, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's, in a sense, almost encapsulating the message that Jesus would give to Louisa 800 years later. The point here is that God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was preparing for when the 20th century would come, when the time for these revelations themselves would arise. Now, there's two saints in the Middle Age, medieval, modern, early modern period that would stand out probably in most Catholics minds as great teachers of mysticism and indeed they were and are Saint John of the Cross and Saint Teresa of Avila the mystical doctors they talked all about mystical marriage and dark night of the soul and things like that incredibly powerful writings which I highly recommend but both of those saints did us a favor and you might not be aware of this but they consolidated all of their teachings into one simple theme and I think every single one of you can guess what that theme is. St. Teresa of Avila wrote in, okay, St. Teresa of Avila, she's well known for this, con, this notion of contemplation, this, this highest level of prayer. It's also the highest level of our calling, and we can actually arise to perfect contemplation of God. And she says, in perfect contemplation, we do nothing our part, we, on our part. We neither labor nor negotiate, nor is more needed. Everything else disturbs and hinders us, except saying, thy will be done. May your will, O Lord, be fulfilled in whatever way you shall please. Since your son offered in the name of all my will as well, there is no reason I should fail on my part. What can we pay? What can we pay who have nothing to give except what we receive? We can know ourselves, and we can do this by his assistance, by perfectly resigning ourselves to his will. Everything else is a hindrance. One caution I give you, do not think of reaching this degree by your own strength or diligence, for it is vain. Even if you had devotion, you will remain cold, but only say with humility and simplicity, which obtain everything, thy will be done. That's in the way of perfection, her famous work there. She's saying that perfect contemplation, the loftiest call of the mystics, the greatest thing we can do, it's all about this simple petition, that saying it with simplicity and humility. And she's pointing out to us that we do not receive this grace by our effort. We don't deserve this, we can never deserve it. We can only ask for it. St. John of the Cross, her student, also a doctor of the church, not she, he wasn't literally, she wasn't a prophet, I mean, they were, um, you, you could call her his mentor, I suppose. They were good friends. St. John of the Cross wrote that the entire matter of reaching union with God consists in purging the will of its appetites and emotions so that from a human and lowly will, it may be changed into the divine will, made identical with the will of God. 
This is the fundamental teaching, not only of Scripture, not only of the fathers, but also of the doctors of the church who came after the days of early church history. This is what was building and building and building like the crescendo of a classical masterpiece is all I can compare it to. But that crescendo coming with the 20th century revelations on the divine will, but very well prepared for in the teachings of the saints before then. St. John Eudes, a, very, a great saint who lived in the 1600s, he said that Jesus Christ only should be living in us and that we should live only in him. Our life should be a continuation and an expression of his life by being other Jesus Christs on earth. That was his teaching, St. John Hughes. St. Louis de Montfort, I think many of you have heard of him as the father of Marian consecration, but he is, pray, he is telling us to be so consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary that we become clothed in her own virtues. And she readily does that. She wants us to receive this gift of living in the divine will more than anyone other than her son does. And by consecrating ourselves to her, that's another powerful way of assuring that we can receive it. Father de Cassad, he's not a canonized saint, but he's an unquestioned spiritual master. Some of you have probably heard of or read um, Abandonment to the Divine Providence. And it's a masterpiece that I highly recommend. He's a 17th century writer here, actually 18th. He wrote, the true philosopher's stone is submission to the will of God which changes into gold, into divine gold, all occupations, all troubles, and all sufferings. Oh, how I long to be a missionary of your holy will and to teach everyone that there is nothing more easy, more attainable, more within reach, and in the power of everyone than sanctity. It will cost you nothing more than to do what you are doing, suffer what you are suffering. Just do it in a holy manner. It is only the heart that needs to be changed. When I say heart, I mean will. Sanctity then consists in willing all that God wills for us. Yes, sanctity of heart is a simple fiat, a conformity of will with the will of God. Here we see it developing a new trend that's equally important, that this highest sanctity is for everyone. And it's, you can even, it almost sounds scandalous to say it, but it's true that it's easy. It's easy. It's only, or you could say perhaps more accurately, it's only as hard as you choose to make it. It's only as hard as you choose to cling to the self-will. St. Alphonsus Liguori says the same thing. He's a doctor of the church. He says, a single act of uniformity with the divine will suffices to make a saint. This is absolutely true. Because he who gives his will to God gives him everything. He who gives his goods and alms, his blood and scourgings, his food and fasting, gives God what he has. But he who gives God his will gives himself, gives everything he has. Let us not only strive to conform ourselves. Conformity with the will of God signifies that we join our wills to the will of God. Uniformity, which is what he's advocating for, Uniformity means more. It means that we make one will of God's will and ours, so that we will only what God's will, that God's will alone is our will. Okay, this is extraordinary. Up until St. Alphonsus' day, and you can even see this right in the, the philosophizing and theologizing of the scholastics a few centuries before, like, like Thomas Aquinas, who Again, greatest theologian ever, but um, a few errors like we all make. They would say that it is imp it's impossible to rise above conformity with God's will, that all we can ever do on earth is imitate God's will. We can try to figure out what it is and then try to do it. But this new development we see in St. Alphonsus Liguori and many other saints, by the way, who from his example agreed with him and, and went in that direction, said, no, we can actually merge our wills with the divine will. We can actually be so unified with the divine will that it's no longer a, fa a matter of trying to figure out what he wants and then trying to do it. Maybe not even really liking it much, maybe rebelling a little bit interiorly while we're doing it, but still doing it. No, we can actually become animated by the will of God such that our will still exists. This is not about Eastern ex Buddhist extinguishing of the self or anything. Our will always exists, will always exist as who we are, but that it's independent operation. 
no longer exist, that has been handed so completely over to the divine will that God's will is the animating force of our lives. St. Francis de Sales says the same thing. He's well known for his work, Introduction to the Devout Life. He's often known as the greatest of the teachers on the spiritual life for the laity. Uh, very practical advice there. But he also condensed all of his teachings into one simple one. He said, the soul that loves God is so transformed into the divine will that it, is, that it merits rather to be called God's will than to be called only obedient and subject to his will. Among the true children of our Savior, every one shall forsake his own will and shall have only one master will, dominant and universal, which shall animate, govern, and direct all souls, all hearts, all wills. And the name of honor among Christians shall be no other name than God's will in them, a will which shall rule over all wills, transform them all into itself so that the will of Christians and the will of our Lord may be but one single will. That's St. Francis de Sales, the doctor of the church, one of the greatest doctors of the church. And this sounds, probably to those of you who've read Luisa Picaretta, it sounds like an excerpt from Jesus' revelations to her. This is exactly what we're being called to today. And I think that he was kind of a prophet in that regard. I think he was almost shown a vision of some future reality. And that reality is what we're called to fight for today. It's what Jesus is revealing privately, but it's revealing still to Louisa, that the time is upon us to have as the whole body of Christians just one will above all our own individual wills. All right, so I'm gonna skip, skip, and skip some more so that I can fit everything I need to about Louisa in here. But I do wanna mention just before we get to that, that this process, which I'm not continuing to trace out all the details of, this process had its own final preparation. And I believe that that final preparation, all these things we've been discussing are preparations for the reign of the divine will. Now, they're not just preparations, don't get me wrong. Like, all of these teachings are and were extremely important in their own right as well. But they're also preparing for what would come in the revelations and the divine will. The final preparation happened only years before, actually only months before, Louisa herself began to write. So Louisa, servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, she was commanded to write by the church. The church required her to write down her revelations from Jesus. And that was in, I believe, I believe 1899. Now I can't remember if it was 1899 or 1889. But does anyone know who, uh, who died just a year before that? Very important. Yes, St. Therese of Lisieux, very important mystic. I see in St. Therese of Lisieux the final preparation of these 1,900 years of arduous preparations for the divine will, her spirituality of the little way. It's, I've got quotes here that I won't go through for the sake of time. But she also locates this in accomplishing the will of God. But what she achieved in doing things, she did achieve what no one else had achieved before her time in convincing everyone that this greatest holiness really is for us all. It's not just for the so-called great saints. It's for each and every person who can really divinize all of their tiny little deeds in life. Otherwise, you know, how are we supposed to understand quotes like the greatest saint of modern times, a, someone who would cause a spiritual revolution? That's what Pope Pius XI said of St. Therese of Lisieux, that she would cause a, cause a spiritual revolution, that, that she was the greatest saint of modern times, according to Pope Pius X. This is true because I really do see in her a preparation for the divine will. And Therese herself, she said that my heart is full of the will of Jesus. I only will what he wills. It is what he does that I love. I do not fear the last struggle or any pains, however great. God has always been my help. I acknowledge that it took me a long time to bring myself to this degree of abandonment. Now I have, re now I have reached it, for the Lord has put me there. She wrote that in the midst of her final illness, her final days. That was actually, I found that in the epilogue of a certain version out there of the story of the soul compiled by the, um, by the, uh, the abbess or the, her superior prioress, 
there. And she said that in this, God was putting the final touches on St. Therese's life in this recognition. So that's a, a turning point in her life. It's a, I shouldn't say turning point, I should say it's a capstone in her own life. So it's not at all surprising that God wasted no time. As soon as her story of a soul, as soon as her little way got out there, almost immediately the church commanded lowly little Louisa to begin writing. God wastes no time. There's no coincidences with him. He's planning this all out perfectly. Okay, and that brings us to the time we are in now, the 20th century, the revelations that have been prepared for for 2,000 years. We see this gift. We've been looking at preparations for the gift of living in the divine will so far. But when we get to the 20th century, we see the gift itself primarily in the writings of Luisa Picaretta. She's the secretary for this that Jesus has chosen. But we also see the same exact thing all over 20th century private revelation, 20th century mysticism, which would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? If this is real, and it is, you'd expect to see many mystics arriving at these conclusions. St. Faustina, I think, is the one that, that's the clearest, and because I want to get to Louisa, I will again skip through most of this stuff here, but she says in her diary, she describes an unprecedented grace of union with God that better and holier souls than itself have not received. Now, that, I, I always share that quote because Faustina answers the first I suppose you could almost say objection that some people have to this gift of living in the divine will. How could I, who am so unworthy, receive a gift even greater than what the saints of ages past did? Faustina is saying that's not the point. Yeah, they're better. Don't worry. You, you receiving the gift of living in the divine will is not going to make you another St. Francis of Assisi or something. But that doesn't mean that you can't receive a greater gift because it's not about our merits. It's about our sincere desire for his will. You know, think about Saint Joseph. He's the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary. And yet he never received the Eucharist. He died before the time of the Eucharist. So we receive a greater gift than he ever did by the fact that we can receive the Eucharist. That doesn't make us greater than him. We'll never be greater than Saint Joseph. So the same kind of pattern holds with the gift of living in the divine will. When such a great gift is presented to us, a gift that contains within itself every other gift, we should respond with gratitude instead of with snubbing our noses as it, at it, supposing that we just can't receive this because we can't possibly be worthy of it. St. Faustina corrects that for us. Her, in her revelations, she writes, your power works through me, Lord, and takes the place of my feeble will. She's referring to divine substitution, substitution of God's will for our own will, for our own will's operation, that is. The turning point in her life occurs in, um, in early on in her diary. And if anyone's read St. Faustina's diary, if you just kind of pick it up and just flip through it real quickly, there's one page that'll really stick out. And I don't know if anyone has tried that, but you can pick up a copy of her diary, flip through it really quickly, and you, your eyes will still just be caught on one page. It's a whole page of her diary, and it's just a big X on it. And they, that's how it was in her own physically handwritten diary, and thankfully the, um, the publishers who have printed the current versions, they did reproduce that faithfully. And Jesus told her to do that, to put up an X through an entire page and to write, from this day on, my own will does not exist. From this day on, only the divine will will be accomplished in me. Jesus told her, this she wrote during a retreat, in which Jesus told her, on this retreat, you will cancel out your will absolutely. And Faustina acknowledged after that, from today on, my own will does not exist. And again, we're not talking about the substance of the will. The mystics are not always absolutely theologically, philosophically precise, that's okay, as long as we know what they mean. She's talking about its independent operation. That's, that doesn't even exist anymore after this day that Faustina handed it over entirely to Jesus so that his divine will alone would be the animating principle of her life. 
He then called her a, ho a living host. And that's another way of looking at what Jesus is asking of us, to be living hosts. Here again, distinctions are necessary. We are not transubstantiated in the literally, literally exact same way the Eucharist is. We never could be. But St. Faustina refers to it as a transconsecration. It's similar. It's analogous. That just as a complete miracle happens in the host when a priest consecrates it, that, that Jesus himself is now the substance of that host. Jesus is asking a similar thing to happen, not with our bodies, but with our souls, that his divine will becomes the substance of its own operation. Father George Kosicki, he was a great apostle of the divine mercy, and he also was a devotee of uh, Luis Picaretta, by the way. I don't know if that's really out there, but I, I've been informed of that by people who knew Father Kosicki well. He wrote about this holiness, this new and divine holiness, which is exactly what we're talking about now. It's just another name for it. He sees it clearly relayed in Faustina's revelations. He wrote, as a quote from Father Kosicki, Pope John Paul II recently wrote of a new and divine holiness with which the Holy Spirit wishes to enrich Christians at the dawn of the third millennium in order to make Christ the heart of the world. The new and eternal holiness is a maturing of the holiness of, that Jesus revealed in the Gospels. It is living the fullness of the Lord's prayer. His kingdom come, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's rightly saying that this holiness, this being a living host, this new and divine holiness, this transconsecration of the self, in a word, this living in the divine will, it's now available in our times and it is a fulfillment of the Our Father's Prayer. And he's going, he's going all the way back to a, to a talk that Pope St. John Paul II himself gave saying that about the new and divine holiness. Now, that's the perfect time for us to skip way ahead. I've got so much more I wanna say about Blessed Conchita and all these other mystics. We won't get to that right now, but you can again see it all in the books I've written on it and more coming in another book soon. This brings us to the crown and completion of everything that we've been considering so far. The crown and completion of all sanctity, the revelations of Jesus to the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Now, that quote that Father Kosicki was drawing from, from JP2, that was given, as I said, at a talk. But this talk was at a gathering of priests for a certain order. That order was called the Rogationists, and the Rogationist was founded by a certain saint, and that saint happens to be Saint Hannibal de Francia. And Saint Hannibal de Francia was the spiritual director and confessor of the servant of God, Luis Picaretta. Now, he wasn't just one of her many directors, one of her many confessors. Saint Hannibal de Francia dedicated the last decades of his life to these revelations. The revelations of Jesus to Luis Picaretta, they were his life's passion. They were his ultimate mission. He had many missions. He was a great saint, fed an orphanage, an order. He did all sorts of wonderful things that we should honor him for. But we should also take his own word seriously. He himself said, at the, towards the end of his life, I have totally dedicated myself to the great work of the divine will. He said this, had, this eclipsed everything in his life. And it is precisely that that John Paul II was referring to in that quote about the new and divine holiness. That's exactly what, what St. Hannibal sees in Luis's revelations. He sees, and this is a quote directly from St. Hannibal, a mission so sublime that none other can be compared to it. The triumph of the divine will upon the whole earth. In conformity with what is said in the Our Father, he said that this must be made known to the world must be made known to the world. We've been focusing so much on the divine will itself, our own need to hand our own wills over to the divine will, because that's what's most important for ourselves. At the end of the day, you only answer for yourself. So yes, you, each of us, we need to focus on living in the divine will ourselves. But this isn't just about that. This isn't just about an individual calling. That's probably what we'll have to devote most of our attention to, yes, for our own growth and holiness, but this is about the whole world. Ultimately, God wills for the whole world to live in the divine will, for his will to be done 
on earth as in heaven. That can't happen if there isn't an earth. <laughs> like, that can't just be a reference to the end of time. His will needs to be done on earth. How would that be done? You know, if we look at the pattern of how God works, how God does his greatest works, we know that he's going to accomplish his will on earth as in heaven. How might he do that? Might he just choose a certain, some lowly virgin who's no one in the eyes of the world, who hands herself over entirely to him? Wouldn't, maybe haven't we kind of heard something similar to that at some point? I mean, we, of course we have. Salvation itself, the greatest event in history, the incarnation. He does the same thing again now that it's time to see the fulfillment of what he's been working throughout all of history, preparing for throughout all of history. And this doesn't mean Louisa is another Blessed Virgin Mary. She's not. Jesus specifically says to her, no, you're not another Blessed Virgin Mary. But he does, she is similar to him in those regards. She, she is similar to her in those regards, that his works are kind of poetic, not just that our Father itself, we talked about the poetic nature of that, but his works throughout history. And there's a quote in Jesus' revelations to Louisa comparing Jerusalem and Rome, basically saying, that just as redemption came from Jerusalem, so the third fiat, the fiat of sanctification, that is the accomplishment of the will of God on earth as in heaven, that will come from Rome. Now, Louisa is not in Rome, she's in Corato, but it's a tiny little city near Rome, same country. Well, where was Our Lady from? Not Jerusalem itself, but Nazareth, a tiny little city outside of Jerusalem. It's this incredible parallelism. And that's, um, that's not just an observation, again, that I'm drawing from this. That's Jesus tells Louisa that was all intentional. This is going to come. This, it's just a matter of time, but it takes our effort, our prayers, our work, our promotion of this. The church will fully acknowledge these in time. They're already approved in many ways, but more approvals will come. Louisa will be canonized. The Pope will proclaim this, and this is going to happen but it depends upon us when it happens. All right, what, what about, more about Louisa herself, though? The, I, I always, I, I like to in, start introducing her with a bit of an ironic point, that she is the single person who lived the most boring life in the entire history of the world. Uh, externally speaking, it's hard to imagine a life more boring than one who is bedridden from her youth up until her death that, age 82, I believe. And yet, that was just exteriorly. Interiorly, she lived the most exciting life you could possibly imagine. Uh, the interior castle, that was one of the works of St. Teresa of Avila, who I quoted recently. So if a saint's interior life is like an interior castle, Luisa's interior life is like an interior continent. It was, uh, you will never find anything in any mystic anywhere close to the, the enormity of what we see going on in Louisa's soul and in these revelations. She was attacked by demons at the youngest of age, youngest of ages, I think she was three when this really started. But this was allowed, permitted by God in order to train her from the earliest age to instinctively flee to him immediately. She, he was forming her from the youngest age to be totally submissive to his will, totally trusting in him. And she, had no power of her own possession to fix anything. Jesus says, I chose you because I went all around the world and you're the littlest soul I could find. She was a victim soul. She soon, at the age of 12, I think it was, she saw Jesus uh, in his passion being persecuted and he begged for her help. And she said yes, and she thereby assented to being a victim soul. Soon after, she could no longer even eat. She could no longer get out of bed. Now, she lived miraculously in the Eucharist alone. Many mystics have done that, though. That sounds extraordinary, and it is, but there's actually a lot of mystics who have lived on nothing but the Eucharist for years and years, decades. Louisa did that. But there's another thing that no other, this has never happened to anyone in church history other than Louisa. Every morning, she would wake up solid as a block of lead, incapable of even moving. No one could move her either. No one could move her. It was just inexplicable. Doctors and do doctor after doctor came in, expert after expert, theologians examined her. This is all being orchestrated by the church. The church was in charge of all of this. She is the most meticulously scrutinized soul in the history of the church, by the church, while she was alive. Um, 
They couldn't figure it out. The only thing that worked was for a priest to come in and bless her. Any priest, as long as he was a priest, if he came in and blessed her in the morning, she'd be instantly, miraculously restored to mobility. So this is an extraordinary mystical phenomenon that, again, has never been seen anywhere before. And it's for a reason. Louisa is the, in this and in other aspects, the, Louisa is the single soul in the history of the church who is the most subject of anyone to the authorities of the church. Jesus wanted this to happen to point, us, point out to all of us that from the beginning, this is coming to us from the Catholic Church. This is as Catholic as it gets, in fact. And we see that even from the details of her own life. We have seen countless verifications of authenticity of the message after her life, but because, I'm gonna skip through that because I wanna get more to the message itself here. You can look all that up if you like. The message to Louisa, I wanna put in a nutshell here, and in fact, I'm just gonna read a page here because I don't wanna miss a word. And it's very important that we at least know, before we run out of time, what this entire message in a nutshell is. The great thing about knowing what this message is in a, in a nutshell is that if you only know this basic, if you just are awake here for another two minutes, which is more than I can usually ask my students, but I have a better feeling about you guys than my, than my students in philosophy. All you need to know is two minutes worth of stuff. And if you're open to that, you can be elevated to a higher spiritual level than a super advanced mystic working on his own merits. I mean, this is, that doesn't mean that you're done. You're still just starting. You're still just starting your journey in the divine will. But that's the great thing about living in the divine will. As soon as you enter into it, that's the most important thing. You're already, you've already attained such a lofty state. And you can lose that by sin, yes, but you can ask for it again. So here is how I would summarize it at least. At this unique moment in the history of the world, the fitting time has at long last arrived in which God wishes to give us his own will the gift that contains every imaginable gift, the true crown and completion of all sanctity, both in heaven and on earth. This gift of living in the divine will, it entails not only the grace to do God's will perfectly, but also the total immersion of your human will within his divine will, so that his will becomes the life principle of your soul, even as your soul is the life principle of your body. It is the holiness enjoyed by Adam and Eve before the fall. It is the same holiness that the blessed in heaven have. And it's the same type of holiness that even the Virgin Mary herself has, even though we can never reach her. Within the gift of living in the divine will is all love, invincible joy, perfect peace, perfect happiness. Within the gift of living in the divine will is absolute assurance of salvation. Within this gift is deliverance from purgatory. You can't even go to purgatory with this gift. Within it is God's infinite pleasure. Within it is the complete victory of every other mission you could possibly acquire in one simple principle. Within it alone is the full realization of your creation in the image and the likeness of God. You cannot earn this gift. You cannot merit this gift. You can only allow God to give it to you. And in exchange for his divine will, he asks only that in addition to continuing to do everything you're already doing as a Catholic striving after sanctity, I'm gonna pause there for a moment. This doesn't replace anything. This is, a, this is the crown and completion of all sanctity. It presupposes all the other stuff. So living in the divine will only makes all of those other, those other things you're doing even more important. It doesn't replace any of them. It doesn't diminish any of them. The rosary, the, above all the sacraments, the rosary, the divine mercy message, divine mercy chaplet, the works of mercy, all that just becomes more important with living in the divine will. Anyway, back to the, back to the message in a nutshell here. He asks only that you lovingly and trustingly relinquish the tiny pebble of your own human self-will and that you desire and ask for his will in return. Whoever you are, no matter what, it is easy to allow him to give you his will. Simply say with sincerity and repeatedly, Jesus, I trust in you. 
Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. Try to converse with him continually like that, all day, every day, as much as you can. Your journey, as I said, is just beginning, but the victory already permeates your every step as soon as you've started. God wishes also to give this gift to the whole world as soon as possible. So pray unceasingly for the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of the divine will on earth, by way of which God's original design for the world and for mankind will at last be realized. Pray with the joy and confidence that come from knowing that the arrival of this reign is a guarantee for it is nothing other than the full realization of the fiat voluntas tua of the Lord's Prayer itself. It is only a question of time, but our efforts can hasten that time. Entrust yourself completely to Our Lady, she who lived more perfectly in the divine will than any other creature ever has or ever will, and she who loves you, her dear child, will especially ensure the path that her, the will of her son becomes your own will, and especially let her sorrows and the passion of her son be always before your eyes. Finally, rejoice always in the invincible and continuous peace that will always permeate your soul if only you believe these truths. And they are true. They really, really are. I've already tried every possible avenue to test out if they're not, because that's what I do as a philosopher, I can't help it. There's no way around it. This is from God. This is real. These promises are real. The ease of receiving the gift is real. So if we want it, if we renounce ourselves, if we have that abnegation of our Lord in the garden, nevertheless, thy will not mine be done. If we renounce ourselves, we'll ask for his will, he gives it to us. And yeah, we can lose it pretty easily because it can't live in your soul along with sin but ask for it again. And I want to prove even more to you that you really can receive this, that it really is easy, because the most important thing about Luis's revelations is that we receive this gift. But what's the most important thing about receiving anything is that no, it's knowing that we can receive it. The greatest obstacles to holiness are discouragement and ex exaggerated anxiety. That's a direct quote from Jesus, not to Louisa, but to St. Faustina. I mean, he said very similar things to Louisa, but he insists to St. Faustina that those are the greatest obstacles to holiness. Now, that sounds really weird, because you might think, wait, isn't sin the greatest obstacle to holiness? And it's actually not. Not because it's okay. It's absolutely not okay. The point is, you can repent of it, you can, have, you can um, be forgiven for it, and there's no guilt in forgiven sin. But if we are discouraged, we give up. And it's that that we must above all make sure never enters into our soul, discouragement. Louisa insists this as well. She wrote, and this is in a letter. She wrote, do you see how easy it is? You do not have to be a religious, a meaning, a, meaning a monk or a nun. <laughs> you have to be religious. You don't have to be a consecrated religious to do this. The sanctity of living in the divine will is for everyone, or rather, to tell you the truth, it is for all those who want it, for all those who want it. And that's the irony here. This is the greatest gift you can possibly imagine. Within it is everything you could possibly want, but it's only going to be, only going to be given to those who ask for it. You have to want it to be given it. This isn't just a default thing that Jesus is going to just give to every Catholic in a state of grace. This is why it's so important to proclaim this message. There will be people who spurn it, just like there are people who spurned our Lord, whatever, shake the dust from your feet. But we have to tell them that if they ask for God's will to be made their own will, after renouncing their own self-will, that it can happen and it will happen. She says it takes, this is also from a letter written by Louisa, it takes nothing but a firm decision of wanting to live in the holy will of God. It is Jesus who wants it. He will cover us with his light, hide us within his love. He will reach the extent of making up for us in all that we are unable to do. And that's huge, making up for us. It's, it's, she's not even saying he'll kind of inspire us and work with us to make sure that we can finish everything. No, she says he'll make up for us. Anything he can't manage, he'll just make up for it. Don't worry about it. I mean, do try. Don't be lazy. But if you really can't manage something, he'll make up for it. 
and so will the Blessed Virgin Mary. I have to share this quote here. The, um, it's from the very last page. I, I almost always share this when I talk about Louisa because I think it's providential. Does anyone have a, a habit of kind of skipping to the very end of a book sometimes? You pick it up. I, forgive me for doing that if uh, I, I do that sometimes myself. So I never begrudge anyone doing that for my book, certainly. And yeah, I did it. Um, I did it for Louisa also. I mean, I've obviously at this point read it all anyway, but the very last entry is so important. It's dedicated to Our Lady. And this is the teaching that the entire Book of Heaven ends on. This is the, Louisa didn't know this. She didn't know this would be her last entry in her private revelations. She just wrote as long as the church commanded her to write and stopped when she no longer was commanded to write. It was very simple. So this was out of her hands. But Jesus, of course, knew that this would be the final passage in her revelations, and there is a reason for that. The whole of heaven prays and anxiously awaits the divine will to be made known, that is, proclaimed upon the earth, to be made known and reign. Then will the great queen, the Blessed Virgin, do for the children of the divine will what she did for her Jesus. And her maternity will have life in her children. I will surrender my own place in her maternal heart to those who live in my will. She will raise them for me. She will guide their steps. She will hide them within her maternity and sanctity. Oh, how I would love for everyone to know that if they want to live in my will, they have a powerful queen and mother who will make up for them for whatever they lack. She will raise them on her maternal lap, and in everything they do, she will be together with them to shape their acts after her own, so much so that they will be known as the children raised and kept and instructed by the love of the maternity of my mother. And these will be the children who will make her happy and will be her glory and her honor. It's the very last teaching in the Book of Heaven there. It's from December 28, 1938. That Our Lady will make sure this happens. All we have to do is stay close to her. Stay close to your mother. And she'll even, again, as we saw just a minute ago, Our Lady also will make up for whatever we lack. I think we, all of us can say we lack some things. You can't let that worry you. You can't sit there thinking, I'm not ready to ask for the gift yet because I got to figure out these things in my life first. No. If you've committed mortal sin, go to confession. Stop doing that. Renounce your self-will. Ask for the gift. If you're willing to do that, you can receive the gift. The same thing was said to Blessed Conchita. She was beatified just a couple years ago, and I really have to share this quote from her because she didn't know about Louisa. You know, all these mystics are having all these messages not knowing about each other, which is another confirmation that this is from God. I, I would have loved to see Conchita reading Louisa's revelations because they would have answered these things for her. She received this grace of living in the divine will, but in her revelations it was called the mystical incarnation. She received it in 1906, but she had to spend the rest of her life trying to figure it out. There's a, a friend of mine as a theologian, Monsignor Arthur Calkins, and he wrote extensively on Conchita. And he says, yes, she, although she received this gift of the mystical incarnation, her, the rest of her life consisted in trying to fathom the depths of this. The great mystic spent her whole life trying to fathom the depths of this one grace she received. This is clearly a reference to living in the divine will. But Conchita herself, she says, my God, this is 30 years later. Close to her death, actually, I think, if I have the, the days right here, the years right. Close to her death, three decades after receiving the gift of living in the divine will, she says, she writes, my God, my God, is it still possible that I doubt to stop and not want to look directly at this grace? Should I not cry over all these years I had kept the grace in the closet because it seemed to me impossible? The bishop and other priests assured me that this grace was new, but certain, and I still had doubts. But then came my director, and she's talking here about the servant of God, Archbishop Louis Martinez, and he drew back the veil and overcame my fears. I promised to fully accept the grace with gratitude. Here I am, my Jesus. May it be done unto me 
according to your word. She wrote that after lamenting having forgotten about the grace because of an exaggerated humility. So let's have our approach to this gift be exactly as Conchita's. And we have every right to do this because we know now of this gift from Louisa and many other mystics. To not doubt anymore, to not think that we're not ready, to not think that we're not worthy, because let, I can just settle it for you now, you're not worthy. You're not ready, but you are ready. You're ready enough, because it's not about you. It's not about us. It's not about our own plan for our spiritual life. It's about what Jesus wants to give us, and it's about what he needs us for, for the sake of the whole world. So we forget about ourselves, and we simply re respond with gratitude to the grace that contains every other grace within it, to the gift that contains every other gift within it, to the fulfillment of all of our longings, the complete happiness that we could ever possibly want, all contained in those words, which if all you're left with is a recognition and a remembrance to pray those words with more faith and more confidence than you ever have before, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think that brings me to all the time I have for this talk but I'm sticking around, don't worry, and I'll stay as long as you guys want me to to answer any questions after lunch. Maybe I'll even get to some more quotes there. <laughs>